Good morning from Hong Kong and good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you for attending our webinar on artificial intelligence and intellectual property protection hosted by our Law and Technology Center at HKU Faculty of Law. I'm Hao Chen Sun. I teach intellectual property and technology law at HKU Faculty of Law. As all of you know, AI is radically transforming many aspects of our society and IP protection of works and inventions created by AI systems has become a very important legal and public policy issue. Recently, IP offices and courts in Europe, the United States and Australia have made decisions on whether AI systems can be protected as inventors. Courts in China have also made decisions on whether works created by AI systems should be protected by copyright law or not. Against this backdrop, we're hosting this webinar as a timely response to these critical developments. We have two panels of distinguished speakers. The first panel deals with AI protection, uh, AI and patent protection. And the second panel focuses on AI and copyright protection. I'm thrilled that our first panel will be moderated by a towering figure in the IP Academy. Professor Ruth Okadaji. Professor Okadaji is Jeremiah Smith Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. She's a leading expert in international IP law. Now, let me invite Professor Okadaji to start our first panel. Professor Okadaji. Thank you, Hao Chen, and good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever uh, you all may be. Thank you for joining us for this important webinar on a topic that has already um, caused the death of, I think many trees we are still publishing, um, but certainly quite um, intense debate in the academy and particularly among um, intellectual property scholars. It is a pleasure to be moderating this very first panel and I look forward to an engaged and um, dynamic um, time. I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, this is a topic that, um, for which there's much that can be said and much that has already been said. And so I will keep the introductions short uh, and uh, most of you are already fully familiar with our distinguished panelists. Introducing in alphabetical order, uh, I am pleased to um, acknowledge the presence of uh, Dr. Ryan Abbott, who is both um, a medical doctor um, and a JD and a PhD. He is a, a doctor in, in every dimension. Um, he's also a professor of law and, and uh, health sciences at the University of Surrey School of Law and an adjunct professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicines at UCLA. Ryan, thank you for being here. Uh, most of you know Ryan um, from his work, uh, The Reasonable Robot, Artificial Intelligence and the Law, which was published in 2020 by Cambridge University Press. He has been a protagonist on this unfolding uh, landscape of artificial intelligence and its intersection with intellectual property law. He's published widely, and um, we look forward to hearing uh, from him. Uh, he will be speaking, as you might imagine, on the subject artificial inventors. Our next distinguished panelist is uh, my dear friend um, and colleague, um, and, and in some ways really the one who has given me um, consistent um, reasons to pull my hair out as I reread something he had written that corrected something I wrote um, or uh, always pushing um, me to uh, more radical positions than I'm comfortable, Professor Dan Burke. Dan Burke is the distinguished uh, chancellor's professor of law at the University of California, Irvine. He's a founding member of that law faculty. Um, he is no stranger to the IP Academy. Uh, he has um, really ranked consistently among uh, one of the leading IP scholars in, in uh, the American Academy. And he has been a leading figure in debates over gene patenting, digital copyright and computer trespass. He is, um, 
known all over the world. He has taught all over the world. In fact, Dan and I have bumped into each other at airports outside of the United States. Um, he, um, in 2015, was selected for a level human visitorship at the London School of Economics, a prestigious position where he delivered a set of really provocative lectures on biotechnology and software patenting in the information society. Um, he is the author of many articles and in particular uh, a book co-authored with uh, Mark Lemley on the um, patent crisis and how courts can solve it. He has written more recently on interdisciplinary perspectives on intellectual property, including literary theory, critical perspectives, and the sociology of science. He is also a scientist uh, with a BS in microbiology, an MS in molecular biology, and biochemistry from Northwestern and a JD from Arizona State and a doctorate from Stanford University. Um, Dan, thank you for being with us. Um, it's a joy to see you. I have known Daniel Gervais since I was a teenager. We worked together when he was much senior to me at the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. Professor Gervais is the Milton R. Underwood Chair in Law and Professor of French and Director of Vanderbilt's Intellectual Property Program at the University of Vanderbilt uh, Law School. Danielle is also the faculty co-director of the LLM program. He's a leading scholar, prolific in the area of international intellectual property. He has written extensively about the intersection of intellectual property um, and um, investment, intellectual property and trade. He is of course the leading author of the well-known and I think um, most cited uh, book on the TRIPS agreement, its drafting history and analysis. It is a leading guide on the TRIPS agreement. Uh, before joining Vanderbilt Law School in 2008, uh, Professor Jarvais served as acting dean and vice dean for research of the common law section at the University um, of Ottawa. He has been a consultant um, to almost every international organization that touches or even breathes um, the phrase intellectual property. Uh, he is a sought after consultant by governments and intergovernmental organizations. He is a wise and trusted voice um, in the development of international treaties and the application of the leading intellectual property um, uh, global frameworks. He's a member of the American Law Institute, where he also serves as associate reporter on the Restatement of Law Copyright Project. And last but not least, our host and the visionary behind this webinar, Professor Hao Chen Sun. Uh, Hao Chen is an associate professor of law at the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. He previously served as director of the Law and Technology Center and of the LLM program in technology. Um, and intellectual property law. He specializes in technology law, Chinese law, the intersections with global intellectual property um, regulation. His recent scholarship has focused on the theoretical and policy foundations of IP, including Chinese intellectual property law um, and the public interest. He has won numerous prizes and major research grants for his projects that deal with China's uh, reforms in the trademark law arena um, and in other areas of intellectual property. He has uh, a forthcoming monograph, Technology in the Public Interest, which will be published by Cambridge University Press um, in 2022. Uh, he also is a trusted advisor to law firms and companies in the entertainment and information law space and has published in uh, a number of media outlets, including Forbes, BBC News, the Los Angeles Times, and the New York Times. As you can see, we have a distinguished panel, uh, lots to talk about. And I will now turn over to our very first speaker, Dr. Ryan Abbott. He will be speaking on artificial inventors. Each of our speakers will speak for 15 minutes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have the task of keeping them all um, on time and in line. So I will do that. Dr. Abbott, over to you. 
Wow, Professor Okediji, that was like the nicest introduction ever. I wish that I could just sort of go around and have an AI based on you introducing me as we go from talk to talk, but I think we should uh, discuss that after the, the event. Anyway, it's my real great pleasure to be here. And as Hao Chen mm -hmm. mentioned, AI is doing some pretty cool stuff these days. Uh, DeepMind famously uh, developed an AI that beat the world champion of the board game Go in 2017, which was the last board game people could outcompete machines at. Uh, that was interesting, but not as useful as AI last year or in 2020, um, COVID makes everything blurry, uh, figuring out how to three-dimensionally sequence two-dimensional protein sequences which is a task that can be vital to drug discovery and all sorts of life science R&D applications. If, if 2020 is too far away from you, uh, last summer, a team at Google published this article in the journal Nature, uh, explaining that they had developed an AI that could automatically generate chip floor plan designs, which is to say the design of microchips, which influences their function. Uh, it normally takes months of interdisciplinary teams, uh, months of interdisciplinary teams working to come up with a new chip floor plan design. This machine could do it in six hours and outperform the human design chips in all major metrics. Of course, there are people involved in this, uh, but the AI is automating the, the ultimate design that comes out of it. This is a case study that Siemens uh, presented at the WIPO first conversation on AI and IP in 2019. The green thing is a car suspension, a standard one, and the silver thing is a car suspension designed by an AI. Siemens wanted to file a patent on this car suspension on the right, but found they were unable to because none of the engineers involved in the project were willing to say that they had invented it. Essentially, they had an AI that could optimize industrial components. They gave it publicly available information on car suspensions. They told it what they wanted, which was well known. And the output of the AI was obviously valuable. So none of the engineers were willing to say that they had exhibited any inventive skill. And that isn't just the vanity of German engineers who sometimes take themselves very seriously. In the United States, inaccurately listing yourself as a patent inventor can render a patent invalid or unenforceable. And if done in bad faith can be a criminal offense. And so this raises commercially the issue of whether if an AI makes something inventive, particularly under circumstances in which you don't have a traditional human inventor, whether that sort of thing can get protection at all. Now, of course, people use AI in the inventive process all the time, and it's not an inventor or a co-inventor. There's a number of ways that someone could be an inventor on a patent. You know, one is by finding a problem to be solved, but usually that isn't something that makes someone an inventor. Most of the time we know what we want. The hard part of the problem is getting there. So we, we know we'd like an antibody to treat COVID-19. We just don't know exactly what antibody. Sometimes programming or training an AI, if it's with machine learning, could make someone an inventor, especially if they're programming a machine to solve a specific problem. Uh, but sometimes the people who program or train the AIs aren't the people using it. For example, if you have the Google chip floor plan automating AI being licensed to Intel to use that to make chip floor plans, or if you have the AI to industri optimize industrial components being licensed to Siemens, um, or at least the AI, the people who are training the AI don't know specifically what problem it's being used to solve, even if they're at the same organization. Um, in the US, to be an inventor, you have to have conceived of the claims of an invention. And if you have an AI that can, at some level of generality, optimize for a particular problem, you may not even know what problem it's being used to solve or what the output is. If finally, someone can be an inventor by recognizing the value of a solution or that the solution solves a technical problem, uh, but probably not where there's no exercise of inventive skill. If GSK asks an AI to find a new antibody to treat COVID and the AI comes back and says, I've seek, you know, looked at a billion antibodies in my library. This is the one with all the best properties. Here's all the data you need to file a patent application. There's no one there who's done anything inventive. And so it's somewhat of an open question, or at least it was a few years ago, whether that sort of thing can get protection. Uh, not to steal the thunder from our copyright panel, but the issue has been alive longer with copyright than it has for patents. Uh, the United Kingdom in 1988 was the first country to 
pass a statute that explicitly provides copyright protection for computer generated works. So those are works made by a computer in the absence of a traditional human author. And for those works, they get a shortened period of statutory protection. And the producer of the work, like a film producer, the person who undertakes to have the work created, is legally deemed the author. The United States has gone the opposite direction. Uh, this is a US Copyright Office policy. It's not a statute or a case law. Uh, but the Copyright Office won't register copyright for anything lacking a traditional human author. They call this now the, the human authorship requirement, and they're citing to the 1886 case of Burrow Giles v. Cerrone, which is the Supreme Court case that held a photograph could be protectable. And in that case, the Supreme Court said something along the lines of, any idea in the mind of an author which is given tangible expression is eligible for protection, and the Copyright Office has interpreted this to think that machines don't have minds, and therefore their output you know, in the absence of a traditional human inventor can't receive copyright protection, and neither can monkeys. Uh, this policy was almost challenged a few years ago in the famous monkey selfies case. This involved a crested macaque named Naruto taking its own picture. In early versions of the story, the monkey just picked up a camera and took its own picture. Uh, people find this adorable, but it's not smiling because it's happy. Smiling is a display of aggression amongst macaques, so he is reacting to his own image in the camera and trying to intimidate that monkey. Uh, in later versions of the story, someone carefully observed the monkey and staged the photograph. But in any case, um, the person who owned the camera went on to try and commercialize it. When other people used it, he threatened them with copyright infringement. And the matter seemed to die down when the US Copyright Office clarified, well, you can't protect this sort of thing. PETA then sued him, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, in the Ninth Circuit in California. Uh, for copyright infringement, alleging that the monkey should own the photograph and they would help the monkey bring the lawsuit. That case was dismissed, but not based on the Copyright Office policy, it was based on standing. Uh, the federal appellate court said, unless Congress is very plainly going to state that monkeys can sue under the Copyright Act, monkeys can't sue under the Copyright Act. And so that policy remains unchallenged today. You know, in some sense, people have been, as Professor Okediji mentioned, talking about this for a very long time. And people have claimed that AI can make copyrightable and patentable works for decades. You know, in some sense, it wasn't that important, though, with copyright, because even though AI could write short stories or generate artwork or write movie scripts, all of those outputs were terrible. We're now getting to a place where artificial intelligence can make some of that stuff almost as well as a mediocre person. You know, for some of it, people can't tell the difference between AI and human generated works. And, and that's going to really change the dynamic here because it means that these works are going to have commercial value, whereas they really didn't previously. On the patent side, there was really no case anywhere in the world about whether if you had an AI generate patentable subject matter without a traditional human inventor, you could protect that sort of thing. Uh, there are laws in some jurisdictions, not all of them, that state inventors have to be natural persons. You know, Largely, though, to the extent that that was explicit in the law, it was done to prevent corporate inventorship. And whether a company could be an inventor is a whole other interesting set of issues considerations, uh, but principally different from an AI. With a company, it can only act through human agents, whereas an AI, at least in the instances we're talking about, the Inventive Act isn't directly reducible to something inventive that a person has done. Uh, this is one reason why I and a group of patent attorneys filed a legal test case involving two patentable inventions, substantively found patentable by the UK IPO and the European Patent Office, uh, for two inventions made by an AI nicknamed Dabis. One is for a flashing light in emergency situations, and one is for a beverage container. And this was filed with the AI named as the inventor and the owner of the AI listed um, as the patent inventor. You know, it's our claim that the right outcome here is to protect this sort of thing because protecting AI generated inventions will encourage people to make, use, and build machines that 
generate innovation that's valuable for society. It'll encourage people owning AI to disclose the results of AI work instead of keeping it as confidential information. And it will allow companies to commercialize new inventions like new drugs that come out of AI where they wouldn't otherwise be able to do that. But even though an AI could legally be a patent inventor, it wouldn't be the owner of a patent. It doesn't have legal personality. The owner of the AI would own the patent the same way if I own a 3D printer and it prints something, I I own that and the machine doesn't get title to it and then transfer it to me. Um, I just own what comes out of my 3D printer. And that is among other things, a, a common law doctrine called accession where you own title to property based on ownership to some other property. Um, very briefly, because we don't have that much time though I can talk about it. The way the machine works is it's a series of neural networks. You train a neural network on something say car suspension designs. And this alters the connection weights between neurons. It then automatically perturbs those connection weights and it starts spitting out new designs. You can then train another neural network called a critic neural network to compare what comes out to the information that went in and say, this is new. And you can train it to model what comes out and say, all right, well, this car suspension you've come up with, this is how it will perform on your key metrics. And so if you tell it what you're looking for and you allow the system to run and you train it properly, out will come out. This is the car suspension you're looking for. You know, that, that was how that can, system worked in the 1990s. You know, now it is composed of hundreds or thousands of neural networks and millions, billions, or even trillions of neurons. And each neural network encodes for a concept. And people train the machine to understand relations between basic concepts, like increasing surface area increases heat transfer. And the machine then in unsupervised runs will combine basic concepts into complex concepts and signal when it has a, a idea of value because it has triggered a particularly important series of neural networks, you know, such as ones for preventing death. You know, in the case of our flashing light, the machine decided that a particular sequence of flashing could attract attention in an emergency situation and save someone's life. And that is the foundational claim in that patent application. Um, last summer, the first patent for an AI generated invention was issued in South Africa. South Africa does not do substantive patent examination. So they don't look at whether an invention is new, non-obvious and useful, uh, but the patents were already evaluated for that in Europe and in the United Kingdom. And South Africa does do formalities examination and everywhere these applications have been denied, it had been on a formalities basis. Uh, outside of South Africa, they were initially denied in 16 other jurisdictions, or sorry, it's pending in 16 jurisdictions, many of which it had been rejected from by patent offices. Uh, last summer, a few days after the South African acceptance, the Federal Court of Australia issued a 41-page reasoned decision why it is appropriate to protect AI-generated works, name an AI as an inventor, and at least in our case, the AI's owner had the best claim of entitlement to the output of the AI. You know, not to give the sense that the uh, cases have been successful everywhere, we lost our argument before the Eastern District of Virginia last year. This case is currently under appeal to the federal circuit. And in the US case, it has largely come down to whether literal language in the Patent Act could be interpreted to allow something other than a natural person to be an inventor. Um, you know, and we both argue that a purposive interpretation is needed of this and that you know, adhering to the strictly literal language of the Patent Act has a negative and unintended consequence in this particular case. Uh, we were rejected by the Court of Appeal in the UK this summer, although the court split, Lord Justice Burst did find that these sorts of inventions should be patentable. Uh, this case is currently seeking leave to appeal before the UK Supreme Court. And the UK government, partly explicitly in response to this case has been running a consultation on, among other things, whether AI generated works should have copyright and patent protection and is considering a number of options for this, um, including expanding the current laws around copyright or changing them to prohibit protection um, or following our suggestions in the patent realm. You know, similarly, India has just done a parliamentary consultation which recommended changing the law to protect this. And the president of South Korea recently announced that the law should be changed to protect AI generated inventions. You know, one of the most recent developments was from the Israeli patent office, which has preliminarily rejected the applications this is being appealed within the patent office, but found for 
for example, this doctrine of accession, which is to say this rule of property ownership that you should own what comes out of your AI is something that is deeply supported by Jewish law, both in the Bible and in various other Jewish texts. It's also a concept dating back to Roman times. And so it's a very interesting interplay of really very traditional law uh, with issues of AI regulation. You know, very briefly, you know, that's a bit on subsistence of AI generated inventions. But as AI becomes ubiquitous and starts taking over for people in broad areas of innovation, you know, like repurposing drugs and effectively replacing your average researcher, it's going to change some of the standards we use to grant patents, like the standard of the person having skill in the art. And if you buy into the theory that one day computers are out going, going to outperform us and replace us at everything, you know, in the far future, you know, one day machines will be setting the standards for whether something can get a patent. Uh, but we don't have too much time on that. You know, very briefly, Professor Okeneji was kind enough to reference the book. And I think that this phenomenon of AI stepping into the shoes of people and doing human sorts of things is really interesting, even for people who aren't involved in AI in IP law, and the fact that the law treats behavior by a person and behavior by a machine very differently, and that this can have unintended consequences. And the book essentially argues that in many areas of the law, this is the case, and we would all be better off as a society, and the law could better achieve its normative goals if we did less to distinguish between AI and human behavior. You know, very briefly as a final anecdote, the book was just translated into Chinese, which I was excited to hear but less excited when I learned that the book had been translated into Rational Robots, The Future of Rule of Law by Ryan Albert. Uh, I got more excited when I learned that the book had been appropriately translated by the Chinese translator who was human, and it was getting inappropriately translated back into English by my browser. So we're not quite ready to be made redundant, uh, but I do think we'll get there. And I'll, I'll stop at that and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abbott, uh, for that um, really precise and, uh, but also comprehensive um, review of both the state of the law and what is happening in various jurisdictions um, on this question, which raises, I think, important um, doctrinal and, and ethical and, and practical considerations. Um, and of course, his created a lot of conversation about the purpose of the patent system um, and the consequences of recognizing um, a artificial um, inventors. We're going to move now to Professor Daniel Jarvet. Daniel, over to you. Yes, I forgot to unmute and let me share my screen. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you for your uh, very kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Hao Chen and the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak at this event. Um, I, uh, I want to share a few thoughts about uh, IP and AI, uh, mostly uh, patents, given that's the theme of the panel. Uh, and let me begin by making uh, two general points. Um, the first is, I think it's a mistake to try to make one single policy for AI and IP. Um, there's an effort, uh, there are efforts uh, in that direction uh, in various places. Uh, First of all, I'm not entirely sure you could circumscribe what AI actually means here. Uh, and second, uh, I think if you're gonna make a single policy, then obviously you're going to make a single policy decision about very different things. We all know copyright, trademarks, and patents are different. They have different origins, different normative underpinnings. The rights are different. The limits of the rights are different. But if you're gonna talk about IP, we have to bring in all these guys as well. So I uh, resist talking about AI and IP as basically uh, one intersection. I think these are multiple intersections. Uh, so that's my first general point. My second general observation is that when we're applying any IP right to AI, however you define AI, what you're doing is you're regulating technology. And we know a lot from uh, experience about technology regulation. Uh, we know that technology is a tool. And that's why we have rules about its use. And that's why we have ethics in particular that applies to the use of many technologies. We know that all technologies can have both positive and negative aspects. 
And here, all I would say is AI is no different. We also know this about technology regulation. There are two types of regulation. One I would call negative to simplify, which is restricting the use of a technology or even a complete ban, which uh, can, this is rare. It tends to work better when it's global uh, or at the very least when there's a multilateral consensus. Uh, frankly, in most cases, it's impossible to achieve and then to enforce. So this is really not what I'm talking about at all uh, today. When we're talking about IT, we're talking about positive uh, uh, regulation in the sense that the purpose of using one or more IP rights in this space is to accelerate the development of AI. And positive uh, regulation as opposed to negative can be used differently in different jurisdictions. Not every jurisdiction has to get to the same answers. It does not require a multilateral uh, approach. Now, most IP rights are indeed accelerants. And the question is, what and where do we want acceleration? Now, uh, like Ryan, I, I won't resist saying at least a word about copyright, even though it's the topic of the next panel. But um, uh, it's in the interest of a full disclosure, if you haven't read my uh, articles, uh, I'm, I'm uh, firmly opposed to accelerating the replacement of human creators, whether they're writers, journalists, songwriters, artists with AI, even though obviously it is happening. But uh, here to simplify, I think that the replacement uh, of uh, human creators uh, entail some significant risks. And before we understand those better, we should not accelerate the replacement. By contrast, in the trademark space, uh, I would uh, uh, recommend a much more hands-off approach. So one of the things we're seeing in AI is uh, AI finding a better ways to manipulate human brains. Uh, and of course, that's the very function of advertising. So not surprisingly, two of the largest companies in the world are advertising agencies. But to me, this is just uh, pretty much a normal evolution of the advertising industry. And at this point, at least, I'm not seeing a need to change trademark law. There might be a need to change other laws, consumer protection and so on, privacy, but not trademark law. Turning now to our main topic, patents. Here it gets complicated. Uh, as Ryan explained, and I agree, there are many positive aspects with AI de deployment, especially in the area of drug discovery. Uh, and uh, it's uh, undeniably accelerating uh, a lot of uh, uh, drug development. But the IP question again is, should we use the patent system to accelerate inventions by machines? And to me, this is really not a matter of faith, and I use the term here very, very loosely, or ideology. It's a, matter of fact. So I have empirical questions that if I were a policymaker, I might be interested in finding answers to. Um, I will leave aside today the question whether machines can invent anything. Some people debate that. I don't. Uh, I think Ryan gave some good examples. And undeniably, there are patent applications that have been filed. We just saw one in the previous presentation naming a machine as an inventor. And then obviously it is clear that machines are assisting human inventors. So that is not what I uh, would want to see more data about. I would want to see data about these questions. So if I were in the patent office, how do machine prior art searches and obviousness determinations change examination practices? I think that might change how patent law is practiced. More to the topic of machine inventorship, what kind of inventions will machines produce? Are those different from those produced by humans? The invention process we know uh, of a machine is different than the human mind. Then conversely, what are the risks of not granting patents to machine inventions? And uh, uh, Ryan mentioned secrecy, and of course that's correct. So overall, do machines add to or replace human inventiveness? And here I ask the questions because most firms have finite R&D budgets and they probably would like to reduce their costs. So in the longer term perspective, we're not there yet, but if machines can really invent commercially valuable products and services on a large scale, will companies tend to use those machines instead of, of humans? 
Uh, and here my question is, what's the longer term valence of having fewer human inventors and scientists? And I wish I had the answer, I don't, but I do suggest the question is worth asking. Then there's this normative point. This is my only slide with a lot of text and I will pause for a second uh, to let you uh, read it. So this is a quote from um, Justice Brandeis' dissent in the very famous uh, INS case from the US Supreme Court, old case, but a case that uh, still um, manages to emerge uh, in, uh, in case law. Uh, actually, it happened just in 2021 again. And the idea is quite simple. It is that IP protection is not the rule. The rule is that things are free to use unless there's an IP right. And we grant IP rights when it's justified. And when is it justified? When public policy seems to demand it. So here again, the question is, does public policy demand protection of machine inventions? Asking this question supports a wait and see approach. A wait and see what? Well, wait and see what the societal benefits are of protecting AI inventions. Put differently, the question is, what do we get by recognizing machines as inventors? Who has the burden of proof to get patent rights? And here, I think the answer is those demanding that recognition, because that's the usual rule in intellectual property and in patent law in particular. Basically, the question is, what more will we get? And what are the associated costs? So we see examples of new inventions made by machines or made faster by machines. But again, are there any associated costs? We can't dismiss them without knowing what they are. And at this point, I do not know the answer. Maybe others do. So putting all this together, as things stand now, I want to be very clear. I am certainly not advocating uh, any restrictions on the use of AI in uh, the uh, field of invention. Uh, I don't think we can, and I don't think we should stop AI inventions. I'm therefore making both a normative point any point about technology regulation. But I do suggest that it would be prudent to gather additional data before accelerating the shift to AI inventions by major R&D firms by granting patents to machine inventions. That, by this, I mean machines that do not have an identifiable human inventor. Now, the reality, of course, is that, uh, and I, I think uh, Ryan explained it very well, that some jurisdictions probably will and some probably will not consider machines as inventors in the coming years which will provide very good comparative data. And I'll come back to that in a second. I also suspect, actually I more than suspect because I've seen uh, some data about this, that in many cases, firms will name a human. Uh, they may not all be as reluctant as the German inventors uh, that uh, Ryan mentioned. Uh, firms will just name a human as inventor to circumvent the issue and recall that uh, patent offices do not typically investigate inventorship. So bottom line is we'll end up in court. Now we'll end up in court, uh, but the different answers will provide, as I said, comparative data. Here's a partial list of data that I think will be really interesting to keep track of in the coming years. Coming back to one question that I've already mentioned, what differences, if any, are there between human and machine inventions? Are certain inventions not made? in jurisdictions that do not recognize machines as inventors. And here, of course, we have the issue of secrecy that might pop up. What are the changes in investment in AI in jurisdictions that do consider machines as inventors? And as my, I mentioned before, what are the changes in employment of inventors and scientists in those jurisdictions? Let's see if there are differences between jurisdictions that go one way versus those that go the other way. We'll get to the determination of whether a machine can be an inventor in different jurisdictions in mostly one of these three ways. So the first path um, uh, is, is quite clear. The uh, patent uh, is issued naming a human as inventor. This I understand is quite common now. The patent is infringed, a lawsuit is filed, but during discovery, which in the US would be normal part of uh, litigation, you realize that in fact, the human really did not invent. And I don't necessarily mean this is a fraudulent claim. I don't necessarily mean there's a fraudulent intent, but really you get to a point where you can argue that the human who is named did not actually 
uh, find the solution to the problem. That inventorship will then be challenged and the court will make a determination. In the second path, the, the patent actually names the machine as an inventor. And uh, as happened in the US and other jurisdictions, the patent office refuses uh, to grant the patent. And that gets challenged in court. And then again, the court will make a determination. This is what's happening in the United States and elsewhere. In the third option, the patent office agrees to issue the patent as in South Africa. But then of course, what can happen is if this patent is in fact infringed, then we'll get a lawsuit and then the inventorship might be challenged. And one question that will be interesting will be how influential uh, even binding will the determinations made by the patent office here. Uh, uh, so how, how important will they be uh, when this gets to court uh, and how much deference will uh, the patent offices get? And obviously no one knows the answer to this uh, just yet. Now, uh, some countries are moving towards a legislative solution. Would this be better? Uh, definitely it would provide more stability in those jurisdictions uh, and legislators are typically better equipped to look at societal impacts uh, than courts. But given the uh, number of empirical risk issues that I've outlined in my brief uh, presentation today, I uh, suggest that it would be risky to cast uh, such a decision in legislative stone uh, as things now stand. So with that, I will uh, stop. Uh, if you would like to read more, I have uh, these two things you can find online fairly easily. Uh, and then I will turn it back to our uh, moderator. Back to you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Danielle. Really um, appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to the questions and answers by the audience. Um, you have raised, I think, some important uh, qualifications um, around both the patent system and its categorizations as we know it today, but also um, the possibility that we can actually make intellectual property law by thinking first um, and not just inventing first. And that's, um, that's significant. Um, we will turn now to Professor Dan Burke and uh, he will be speaking to us um, on the topic, algorithmic bias in the coming patent system. Uh, Professor Burke. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for making this opportunity available. And thank you, uh, Professor Okedeji for the very nice uh, uh, introduction. Um, uh, I wanna pick up on some points that uh, Professor Gervais just made uh, uh, with regard to um, uh, the regulation of technology. I think, I think those, are, those are salient points. Uh, and, and he said something about, uh, about ethics and, uh, and the role of ethics. Uh, my friend at Oxford University who teaches uh, and, and writes in the area of information ethics, uh, Luciano Floridi, has been saying for a number of years with regard to AI, you know, that there are some questions that really matter. They're sort of existential questions. And there are other questions that don't matter. And, and, and the, the questions that matter are so pressing and important that we don't have time to waste on the ones that, that don't matter so much. Um, so I'm, I'm going to hopefully pivot here to a, a question that I think really uh, matters and is, is kind of one of these existential questions, which is the problem of, of bias uh, in, uh, in AI systems. Um, and in order to address that question, uh, I think uh, it's good to have a couple of reminders uh, uh, for ourselves. Um, uh, first, that you know, we're talking about artificial intelligence, and that is a, a really unfortunate term. It's a really unfortunate label. Uh, because there's nothing intelligent going on here uh, in any robust sense of that, uh, that word. That sort of um, uh, research, of course, has been done. It's been, been going on for decades uh, in the so-called artificial general intelligence or, or go fi good old-fashioned artificial intelligence. Um, it's been a complete failure. Uh, so we have nothing even remotely approaching, you know, the R2-D2s and, and commander datas of the science fiction uh, movies and television shows, and there's good reason to think that we probably never will have. Instead, what we're talking about that, that uh, Professor Abbott uh, d described to you uh, is a subset of that, right, machine learning systems. And even the term learning here makes me a little twitchy, right? Because machines don't actually learn. Um, uh, it might be better to talk about them as pattern recognition systems. Um, uh, although again, recognition might be a little bit anthropomorphic. Uh, probably the best label I think is that these are uh, statistical optimizations uh, software systems, iterative uh, systems uh, 
uh, which uh, Ryan described this to you a little bit, you know, which they, they fit a statistical model to a large set of data. Uh, and then they uh, iteratively, uh, bit by bit, uh, get a better and better fit to that data until they reach some, uh, some optimal parameter. Um, and if we talk about it in that way, uh, we tend to get a, uh, away from some of the science fiction uh, uh, that uh, sometimes permeates uh, some of the discussion about this technology. Um, this is uh, mostly old technology, uh, things like neural networks and that kind of architecture that's been around for a long time, for decades again. Um, the statistical models that are used have been around since the 19th century. So what's really new here, uh, as you may gotten a sense from the presentation so far, um, is we have really fast processors and uh, computer memory is, is relatively cheap when the supply chain doesn't break down, right? Um, and since we live in kind of a uh, digital surveillance society, uh, huge amounts of data, very large data sets can be collected and stored in that cheap computer memory. Um, and then you almost have to have uh, these kinds of AI machine learning uh, statistical optimization systems to sort through all that data. Uh, but that's what's really changed is that we have got these large data sets and very fast processors uh, to deal with them. So uh, these are going to intersect uh, with intellectual property. Uh, and in particular, we're talking about the patent system. They're going to intersect with the patent system in, in three different ways that you've already heard a little bit about. So we'll kind of, let's kind of collect those together. Um, first of all, uh, in generating new uh, creative or innovative uh, artifacts, right? Uh, and Ryan uh, Abbott gave you some examples of that. Uh, both in the copyright area and in, and in the patent area, uh, you know whether we're talking about generating new uh, new texts, new music, uh, new uh, graphics and, and artworks in the copyright area, or new types of machines. Uh, Professor Gervais mentioned this is uh, very central now to pharmaceutical uh, drug discovery. Um, uh, so, so it could be uh, in, in the patent area, it could be in, uh, in copyright, but it's going to generate the subject matter of intellectual property. Um, secondly, uh, it is itself the subject of intellectual property, right? Because we're talking about machines and software systems uh, that uh, are potentially subject to patents if they are novel and useful and non-obvious um, and uh, could be the subject of copyright because copyright covers uh, types of software. Uh, so they themselves could be the subject of, of intellectual property. And then as Professor uh, Gervais mentioned kind of in passing, and I wanna focus on this a little bit because I think this may be one of the most transformative uh, intersections, um, these can be used for the administration of intellectual property, right? So intellectual property uh, offices, patent offices around the world in the United States and elsewhere are looking actively at the use of uh, AI systems to assist examiners. Uh, Professor Gervais uh, made uh, some allusions to this, uh, either to help them interpret claims uh, or to determine non-obviousness, uh, or maybe in some cases you can replace the examiner entirely, right? Uh, because as Professor Gervais points out, that would that would help your budget. Right? Um, so uh, the same is true in trademarks, as he mentioned. You know, sort of searching prior art, looking for images. The machine may be much better at that than the than the human is. Um, and of course, if a patent office can do it and an examiner can use this, then uh, certainly you would think that a judge could do this. Uh, so this is going to show up in, in enforcement of intellectual property as well, interpreting claims and, uh, and so on. Right? Um, so those are, those are the, the three possible areas uh, that we uh, have under consideration that we want to think about. Now, a fundamental premise of my presentation, um, which I don't think should be controversial, is that technologies embody and, uh, and reflect the values of the people who created them. And again, I think that's inherent in some of the things that Professor Gervais said uh, just a few moments ago. Um, this this is, shouldn't be a surprise, shouldn't be controversial, right? It's the whole basis for archeology span and for the humanities that we can take a statue or a piece of pottery or uh, a tool from another time and place and culture, take a look at it and it tells us something about the people who created it, what their practices were, what their beliefs were, what their expectations were. And the same is true of modern technologies, including machine learning technologies, right? Um, and when we use them in the context of intellectual property, either to create intellectual property or to administer intellectual property systems, um, uh, those values are going to be reflected, right? Uh, so what are those values? What, what are those uh, uh, those expectations and practices? Um, well, we're discovering that our values and our expectations and our practices in the intellectual property area uh, are, are kind of unattractive sometimes, right? Um, in particular, we're discovering, uh, I'm going to focus again here mostly on patent law, but this is true for, for other areas. Um, we're discovering that there uh, is a systematic 
uh, bias, systematic racial and gender discrimination in the patent system. Um, and this is true in every jurisdiction. I'm gonna talk mostly about the United States because we have the most data right now about the United States. Uh, but when we look at patent offices around the world, we find the same sort of thing. So uh, we know, for example, that uh, uh, the number of female inventors, right? The number of applicants for patents uh, who are women um, is well below 50%, right? In the United States in a good year, it might get up to 20 or 25% of patents have named a female inventor. Um, uh, and again, this is true around the world. Uh, the last data that I saw from the Germanic, uh, German speaking countries like Austria and, and Germany, um, it was as low as 4% of, of patent applications had a female inventor. Uh, there are some other countries uh, in South America where it's a little bit higher, maybe 30%, um, but it's never very good, right? In no case is it anywhere near 50%. Um, we're starting to, have, to get data that's harder to do this empirical work, but, but it's being done, uh, showing us the same is true on the basis of race. Uh, that inventors of color uh, in the United States, particularly uh, you know, Latino or African-American inventors are hugely underrepresented compared to the general population. It's a very small fraction of patents uh, that have a, an inventor of color uh, applicant. Um, uh, and uh, you know, again, we're mostly talking about the patent system here, but we know that this is true in other areas. We know this is true in copyright registrations. We know that it's true in, in trademark registrations, right? So there's a systematic underrepresentation and exclusion of uh, uh, by gender and by race uh, in, in these systems. Um, well, when we uh, look at the progress of a patent application through the patent office, again, uh, we're, we're finding data, I'll, I'll start with gender, uh, that indicates that uh, a patent application that has a woman as an inventor um, is more likely to be rejected. Uh, it's more likely to have its names, uh, the, 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 the claims uh, are narrowed by the time it issues, if it ever does issue, and more often it doesn't issue. And we're starting to get the same si kind of information uh, again for uh, persons of color, inventors of color, don't apply for patents very often. And when they do, they're most likely not gonna get a patent. Right? Um, uh, so, uh, you know, there, we see systematic exclusion at all levels. Um, the first uh, response you might have is to say, well, uh, that's because we don't have enough, uh, you know, engineers and scientists who are women and who are people of color. And that certainly is a problem, but it is not the problem that we are talking about. When you take similarly situated cohorts of, uh, say, female engineers or engineers of color, uh, and then uh, their counterparts, you know, who are white and male, um, the, the woman uh, who invents something is uh, much less likely to apply for a patent. Uh, women use the patent system 40% less, um, even when we're talking about similarly situated uh, uh, cohorts, right? So, so it's not just a problem of, of having more people in the, in the STEM areas in engineering and science, um, it's that they don't use the system or they're being excluded from the system. And we're uh, learning historically why this came about and so on, um, but this is a problem sort of across uh, intellectual property uh, systems. So, uh, you know, the embedded values in our intellectual property systems seem to include excluding uh, underrepresented uh, genders and, and, and uh, 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 persons of color. Um, and uh, the problem then that we, that we are, should be worried about is if we start to incorporate AI into either creating new works or administrating intellectual property, will those same biases show up in uh, that administration using the machine learning systems. Um, we have to be careful here with the word bias. I'm going to spend just a second to, to talk to you about that because, um, uh, you know, computer scientists and statisticians are very worried about bias, um, but they're worried about bias in a technical sense, right? You know, that they're going to have uh, skewed samples or, or biased samples. Um, we're talking about social bias here. And again, we mostly want to talk about patents, but let me say, just uh, give you an example from copyright, uh, kind of anticipating the next panel, and then it will make the patent uh, point very obvious, right? So some of you have seen this and heard about this. This is the uh, so-called next Rembrandt, right? Some computer scientists uh, trained a neural network on the digitized paintings of the Dutch painter Rembrandt. Um, and then had the AI generate a new image in the style of Rembrandt. We got quite a lot of publicity a few years back. Um, uh, art historians looked at this and they said, well, uh, this is an image of a Western European white guy wearing some period clothing. Why is that? And the computer scientist said, well, because Rembrandt painted a lot of pictures of Western European white guys uh, wearing that kind of clothing. And the art historian said, well, yeah, but he also painted a lot of pictures of women. Uh, why didn't you train the AI on that? 
Uh, and for that matter, he painted a lot of pictures of Africans and people of color. Why didn't you train the AI on that? Why didn't we have why didn't we get that kind of an image? And they didn't have a good answer. The computer scientists just said that this seemed more typical to them of Rembrandt, kind of Rembrandtish. Um, so you find out that this picture has very little to do with Rembrandt. It mostly has to do with uh, the biases and implicit uh, expectations of the people who designed the system, curated the data, and, and trained the AI, right? Um, now, that's a copyright example, but uh, go back to my example of using AIs, for example, to help an examiner determine non-obviousness. If we know that uh, we have a history of uh, exclusion of women and racial minorities, uh, from the patent system, and we then use those patents that were judged not obvious to train an AI, all those biases gets translated into the standard the AI is going to, going to start using. Um, uh, so this, this will show up uh, ubiquitously across different types of intellectual property, uh, not just if you're trying to generate a picture of Rembrandt. Um, now, our friend Anupam Chander at Georgetown University said, well, uh, you know, humans are biased, and so AIs are going to be biased too. So let's not worry about where the prejudice is coming from. Let's just fix it, right? If we see something that's biased or prejudiced, look at the outcome and fix that. That's a perfectly good uh, suggestion. As long as you think that the bias that is exercised by machine learning systems in these kinds of situations is similar to or the same as uh, what you would see from a human. And in closing, I'm going to suggest a couple of reasons why I think that that may not be the case, right? First of all, uh, we know that humans uh, put too much weight or give too much trust to machine uh, made decisions, right? It's actually very interesting research. Um, humans are more likely to trust their own judgment over an AI, but they trust the AI over somebody else's judgment, right? You know, so I'm, I'm smarter than the machine, but I'm pretty sure the machine's smarter than you. Um, so uh, the decisions made using AI or uh, inventions developed using AI may get uh, more weight and more attention uh, than they're supposed to. Um, so that's one thing to be worried about. Final thing to be worried about is that we know that these systems are performative. Right. We know that uh, AIs uh, tend to reinforce uh, the assumptions that they are built on. Um, uh, we give lots of examples of that. And if that's the case, uh, then again, this is not a simple uh, type of prejudice that we uh, would, would see from humans. How do we solve that? I think Wendy Chun has the, has the answer. We need to think about this as being more like uh, predicting the weather, right? We use uh, uh, algorithms to predict the weather. We don't think that that actually is the weather. Um, and we need to develop the same kind of relationship with AIs if we're going to use them in these ways. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that and look forward to the comments and the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Burke. I was thinking as you were speaking of the um, irony, um, just reflecting on the three uh, talks that we've had so far, um, an IP system that clearly has historical roots um, with bias embedded um, but also a system that, that did not emerge because a group of thoughtful, um, creative legislators sat around a table and said, let's design the best system. It was a system that emerged incrementally in response to whatever the felt social needs, exigencies, um, political pressures of the day and of the moment. Um, and so rather than having a blueprint, um, we, we really went in many ways grasping um, in the dark. And the fact that the patent system has worked as well as it has worked um, um, in terms of its capacity to, to incentivize um, innovation. And, and I will say that I have my own skepticism about, about that, that narrative, but to the extent that we believe it, um, it is certainly not by design, and that suggests that many errors um, that we should avoid with each new generation of technology is something we should take the luxury to, um, to consider. And I, I think um, as we listen to uh, these talks and as we contemplate uh, the redesign of intellectual property in the era of um, artificial intelligence, it's, an, it's, it's a real... Um, challenge to not want to be rushed by the technology um, and to instead step back um, and ask what are the costs of these decisions that we might make. Our last speaker um, on the panel 
is um, Professor Hao Chen Sun, who is also um, our host. And as I said earlier, the visionary behind this webinar, he will be speaking on um, artificial intelligence inventions. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing uh, from him. He will be the last word on the panel before we open up for uh, comments and questions. Um, Professor Sun. Yes, uh, thank you, Ruth. I hope I can find my yes slides quickly. Here we go. Um, thank you, Ruth, for the lovely introduction. So I'm going to uh, move on to talk about uh, po public policy issues as well. So uh, uh, and uh, as Ryan and uh, uh, other panelists uh, have already mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, 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 pen offices uh, in Europe, uh, and United States have made decisions on whether uh, AI system could be recognized as inventors and uh, courts there have already uh, made decisions. But largely, as Ryan pointed out, on the basis of natural person argument, um, AI system are denied as inventors because according to the uh, statutory provisions, uh, the laws in Europe and uh, in UK in particular and United States only recognize natural persons as inventors. So these are by, by and large statutory interpretation without considering much of public policy implications. But if we move down to the Australian ruling that Ryan mentioned earlier, okay, uh, the Federal Court of Australia actually focused heavily on a uh, public policy issue, uh, as I will uh, uh, show a little bit later, okay? So this natural person uh, argument was denied by the Federal Court of Australia. So let's take a look at how the Federal Court of Australia uh, uh, apply the public policy considerations. So let me quickly read it out to you. According to the judge, it is consistent with the object of the Patent Act to construe the term inventor in a manner that promotes technological innovation and the publication and dissemination of such innovation by rewarding it, in respect of whether the innovation is made by a human or not. So I wanna uh, uh, you know, focus on public policy as well, uh, but uh, by casting doubt on the way that the Australian ruling has applied uh, the public policy considerations. And um, um, I think Daniel and uh, Dan have already mentioned uh, uh, public policy issues, but the, the, the factors that I'm going to talk about uh, include, these are the public policy considerations. We also need to bear in mind when we deal with AI inventorship the first one is about piercing the so-called the veil of AI inventorship. And the second one is about responsibility. The third one is about innovation. The fourth one is about the public domain. Okay, so uh, the first point is about piercing the veil of the inventorship. So this so-called piercing the corporate veil, I, I'm pretty sure that you know, many audience uh, knows about this, uh, doctrine. So this doctrine basically refers to a situation in which courts put aside limited liability and hold a corporation's shareholders and directors personally liable for corporations acts and debts. So in ordinary circumstances, uh, limited liability uh, serve as a shield protecting um, a corporation's shareholders and directors. But the piercing, uh, piercing the corporate veil doctrine actually lifts it, right? And when circumstances arise, then it holds that, uh, you know, people behind, shareholders and directors behind corporate deals will be held responsible for their decisions. So here is a, a typical decision on uh, this doctrine. So in this US case, treatment by an individual's assets of the corporation as uh, one's own uh, asset uh, was established as a justification for piercing of the corporate veil when an individual used the company funds to carry out his own 
uh, penchant for risky trading. So this kind of, you know, uh, personal, this showing of personal control of corporate asset and then potential abuse it or would be, uh, uh, will be uh, the triggering factor of uh, the application of the piercing the corporate veil doctrine. So I want to apply this doctrine to the, the AI and patent issues that we're talking about. So first of all, we need to recognize that the inventorship of a patent is inextricably intertwined with the ownership of the patent. So when somebody applies for a patent, he, he or she needs to point it out that he or she is the original inventor of the uh, invention concerned. And then when an invention is approved, right? So then he or she will be automatically recognized as the inventor of the invention. But according to the, your, uh, according to the Australian ruling, um, while recognizing uh, Davos as the inventor, uh, of the two inventions concerned, um, then uh, Dr. Taylor, who is the uh, owner, programmer, and operator of this AI system, has been recognized as the owner of the invention, not the AI system itself. So this is a very surprising um, uh, outcome. But then I think that gives us the, the opportunity to apply the Pierce the Veil uh, doctrine to see that it is actually Mr. Taylor, who is the owner of the uh, inventions as well as the uh, AI system. Okay, so for other AI inventions, I uh, would also argue that we also need to pierce the veil of the AI inventorship. And uh, it's pretty easy for us to see that it is the most likely the developer of AI system that will be deemed owner of the uh, AI inventions. So this gives to, uh, to the doubts that uh, whether it is necessary to recognize AI inventorship, recognizing AI system as inventors, because we now have like this kind of tricky issue, right? An inventor uh, that is AI, but at, it, at the same time, owner is a you know, human being. So I wonder whether it is necessary uh, in terms of this kind of public policy, we, uh, we need to pierce the veil of AI inventorship and just rightly go directly to uh, the, uh, the developer AI system, namely human beings. So we, uh, we don't actually need to create such a two-tier system. I think recognizing human uh, inventorship is pretty much enough. The second public policy consideration is about responsibility. Um, so the basic question is about whether AI system can really take whole range of legal and social responsibilities. Uh, the answer is negative. Okay, so let me tell you why. First of all, we have a whole range of legal responsibilities attached to uh, patents. So for, for example, we have, uh, you know, uh, a patent, patentees might be held liable if he or she uh, fraudulently lists a, a wrongful inventor. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, an, an, an application needs to uh, state that who is the uh, original inventor. So this, if this statement, you know, is uh, false was, uh, and, uh, at the same time made in bad faith and the party concerned will be held liable and subject to civil and criminal penalties. And panties also have the duty to sufficiently disclose technical information. If an AI system fails to do so, then he, uh, the system will be held liable. But the question is, how could the system be held liable for, for the wrongful doings that I just mentioned, okay. And then the third legal liability or responsibility is concerned with infringing acts that inventions may commit. Um, there are two kinds of uh, infringing acts that I can envision for the time being. First of all, inventions themselves might contain infringing materials uh, or process, applying process that have already infringed the uh, 
uh, other in, uh, you know inventions or pro, uh, inventions. So then the AI, AI system will again be held liable, uh, right? So and then the second scenario deals with inventions such as devices uh, used in, for example, driverless cars. Uh, but what what if the driverless cars cause an accident, and by using the device concerned, then uh, the AI system again will be held liable. So then there's a big question mark about uh, how AI system can, uh, you know, uh, effectively take for these legal responsibilities. So far, I cannot see this kind of uh, possibility if uh, technology uh, could develop developments are not advanced enough. Okay, then let me move on to talk about social responsibility. I think this is also very important. For example, Article 7 of the TRIPS agreement recognized that uh, IP system is a balanced system consisting of rights and obligations, as you can see from the Article 7. So this here obligations largely refer to social responsibilities. If you uh, read through Article 7, you can see that, for example, responsibility to promote technological innovation, transfer uh, and disseminate technology to the mutual advantage of producer and users of no uh, technological uh, knowledge, and I think, uh, and also uh, in a manner conducive to social and economic welfare. Okay. And I recently published an article uh, arguing that uh, pan owners should take three concrete social responsibilities, namely uh, the responsibility to reciprocate for public contributions. Um, um, pan owners normally draw on many resources to uh, invent, so they need to reciprocate uh, 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 for public contributions. And they also need to fulfill innovative role responsibilities. And thirdly, I argue that they also need to confront injustice created by patent protection. So then again, there's a big question mark, how AI system are intelligent enough or whether it is really possible for them to take for social responsibilities. And then third uh, issue is again, uh, um, um, related to uh, uh, previous panelists to mention about, it's about innovation, okay? So um, um, I think when we ground patents, we need to consider whether patents actually promote innovation in long-term or not, okay? So innovation itself is actually, uh, you know, does not occur in vacuum. It's a sequential phenomenon. It's also, uh, you know, it's a social phenomenon. So sequential innovation actually is quite, uh, you know, prevalent in uh, in tech sector. It often occurs in uh, cumulative and in interactive contests. It also involves incremental and cumulative improvements on existing technologies and inventions. Um, no one actually uh, invent in a vacuum and uh, uh, most of inventors stand stand on the shoulder of uh, previous tech giants. Okay, and the second uh, innovation uh, deals with uh, combinatorial uh, invention. So this phenomenon deals with situations in which people actually combine existing uh, innovations or technologies and then come up with new technology. So this kind of combination. Uh, itself also draws on existing innovation. And social innovation is a recent uh, so, you know, uh, argument that sees innovation, certain kind of innovation has, you know, this kind of social welfare as it's an ultimate uh, objective. For example, public funding provided for, uh, you know, to, to develop, providing for, you know, the development of uh, COVID vaccines. You know, so then th there's you know fundamental question about whether recognizing <sighs> AI system as inventors actually promote innovation. The more AI patents we have, the more innovation we <clears throat> want to promote in long term or not. Um, I think chances are they're not. Because um, as I mentioned earlier, innovation normally occurs in a cumulative uh, and uh, you know, uh, in incremental manner. So drawing on existing information 
uh, free of charge is very important. So I have a doubt about, uh, you know, granting um, this kind of, you know, the more the better, uh, you know, uh, thesis is to me quite problematic. And also we need to pay attention to the patent trolls phenomenon. People have been sitting on a lot of, you know, patents in order to sue others or deter innovation. So I think uh, uh, granting AI uh, patents, uh, you know, even puts us at the greater risk of this kind of uh, patent troll problem. So let me quickly uh, mention the fourth public uh, policy factor. It is uh, concerned with the public domain. I think the public domain is uh, dear to the heart of uh, every user of intellectual property uh, related works and inventions. And uh, uh, public domain is uh, itself, itself is a contestable concept. Uh, for example, in copyright law, it could be broadly defined to cover or on all kinds of uncopyrightable elements, uh, and also uh, copy uh, works that has uh, you know that works that have expired, and even including, for example, copyrighted works that are subject to fair use privilege. So this is a very broad definition. But in patent law, I think it's safe to arrive uh, at the definition uh, in this way. It pub we can. Uh, say that public domain roughly refers to technical information that has been publicly disclosed, but is not protected by an enforceable patent. For example, the patentable subject matter doctrine has been, uh, you know, a, a filter to uh, protect the scope of public domain. Uh, things like discovery, scientific theories, mathematical methods, laws of nature, natural phenomena abstract ideas are not patentable, so they are placed in the public domain, free for everybody to use. And term of uh, patent protection also uh, 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 protects the public domain. Uh, expired patents naturally flow into the public domain, and then they will become free for everybody to use. So I would like to argue that inventorship nowadays also uh, can serve as a filter to protect the uh, the scope of public domain. As the uh, the current uh, Davos case has already demonstrated, if we recognize AI as inventors, chances are there will be more things that will be protected as uh, uh, patents. And there will be more um, incentive to recognize AI system as inventors. So then there's a, chance that uh, you know this will uh, cause harm to the public domain because we in the end of the day we might draw more uh, you know technical solutions in the scope of private uh, control instead of putting them in a the public domain so uh, in terms of uh, 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 the the public domain I think we we'd better say thank you and goodbye to AI inventors and uh, the uh, another perspective is about the the data that AI system has been uh, Professor Sun, taken, I just want to yes. let you know that that you uh, should probably try to wrap up so we have some time yes. to to get questions. Thank you yes, so much. I, You're the host. I'm wrapping up, yes. but uh, I will be you. keeping keeping time. Okay, thank you so much. So I, I'm wrapping up. Um, so the public domain uh, the issue is about uh, AI system have been heavily drawing on public domain data. So if we protect AI inventions, chances are that again, we are uh, putting, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a lot of technical issue uh, information in into private control, and then there's also, uh, you know, a chance that uh, uh, that will harm sequential, combinational, and uh, social innovation. Thank you very much. Sorry that ran out of time. Thank you so much um, for that rich presentation. Thank you so much, all of the panelists. If you would turn on your videos, if they're not already on, there are questions in the chat. Um, but I wanted to give at least one opportunity to the panelists each uh, to respond to the views of each other. Uh, the, these are not uh, consistent views. There's some um, areas of marked tension. 
And I think it's important to at least um, allow the panelists to um, engage with one another and perhaps reflect or respond to some of the claims made in the other presentations. So I will begin um, probably pr with uh, Professor uh, Jarvais. Uh, you actually had a question put to you uh, by Professor Sun um, and um, others in the chat. So let me just give you a, a minute and a half each to each of the panelists, and then we will take some questions from the Q&A. Oh, thank you. So the the question is about um, WIPO and whether WIPO should be uh, recommending uh, one size fits all or some other type of solution. Uh, obviously, based on my presentation, the answer is, is no, um, because uh, first of all, as I said, I, I don't think you can put IP in one bag. I think IP is a lot of things and they need to be dealt with differently. Um, and, and secondly, I think without empirical data to make without enough empirical data, at least from my perspective, I think it's very early to make these calls, but I think WIPO has been prudent. They've uh, organized conversations about AI and IP, which I believe is the first time they've used this, uh, this term uh, in, uh, in the, at least a long time, if, if not uh, ever. Uh, we're having the fifth WIPO conversation uh, in April. The, the first one, uh, three years ago, uh, reflected the questions in the one of the papers I mentioned, my big data and IP paper. Um, now they've made quite a lot of progress. I think that policymakers from all the WIPO members uh, who attend uh, have a much better understanding of the issues. Uh, but of course, the, what's happening at this point is that courts are being asked to make determinations and the court can't say, well, I don't have societal empirical data, so I'm gonna, no. The court obviously has to make a decision based on doctrine, based on its own policy appreciation and so on and so forth. And that's, that's why we're gonna get different answers in different jurisdictions because uh, the doctrines are fuzzy and the judges see things differently. Uh, the final thing I will say, uh, so it, when, when Auchin was speaking, I was uh, struck by um, uh, his emphasis on uh, responsibilities and uh, uh, development. So I, I would certainly, think that it's not too controversial to suggest that the benchmark here uh, should be human development, um, not technological change, qua technological change, not more stuff, qua more stuff. Uh, and I think uh, that to me is the benchmark. It doesn't mean it's easy to figure out what human development is, but at least uh, it's not just change. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, I think I, I think there's there's another conversation we should have uh, based on that, perhaps another webinar or even, dare I suggest, a, a real in-person conference someday about that specific issue. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, thank you so I'm, much. Uh, Professor Burke, go ahead. Well, so I, I'm not sure that this is that this is a, a, a point of tension, right? I, I just really want to subscribe to a couple of the points that uh, Professor Gervais made and, and underscore them. The, the first one being what, what I call the Kastenmeyer rule, right? You know, uh, Robert Kastenmeyer was for many years a very distinguished member of the American uh, Congress, House of Representatives, chaired the courts, uh, the, the, the Committee on Courts and Intellectual Property. And, and he always said, you know, if somebody wants to expand intellectual property law, it's incumbent on them to come forward with the data come forward with the proof that that needs to happen and needs to expand. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's exactly the right posture. Um, and our friend Reto Hilti at the Max Planck Institute in, in, in Germany, in Munich, has been pointing out for a number of years that we have absolutely no indication at all, no data at all, indicating that there's any underinvestment in the use of AIs or the development of AIs uh, to produce these kinds of uh, you know works that that they've been producing. If anything, we're probably overinvesting, right? Um, so if somebody wants to wants to expand intellectual property law to include uh, AIs as inventor, it's really incumbent on them to come forward with the data in exactly the way that Professor Gervais is talking about uh, before we make that kind of move. So I, I, I wholeheartedly subscribe to that. And the second part of his talk that I want to very wholeheartedly subscribe to and underscore. Um, is this, this uh, issue of human development, right? Uh, there's a great book that's out on, on uh, artificial intelligence and art. Uh, and the author says, I think very trenchantly, says the question is not whether an AI can be creative. That's the wrong question. The question is what does it mean for a human to be creative in the environment that we are creating 
you know, surrounded by, uh, by these types of, of uh, machine learning systems. And, and Ryan mentioned a little bit of that towards the end of his talk. Um, that's really what we need to, what need to be talking about. And I, I said, you know, there, there are important questions and unimportant questions. I think Professor Gervais has identified there the important question, right? As you know, how do you have human flourishing? How do you have human creativity uh, in the environment that we're creating? And then once we can answer that question or get a sense of that question, then we know how to regulate, right? Um, and that's, that's the order in which we need to proceed. Sir, I guess I would chime in here, although I think we only have one more minute. So I'll, I'll try and make three points in one minute. Um, on the white You can have point, your you know, full 1.5 minutes. Excellent. I, all right, I can speed it up. I think WIPO is absolutely doing the right thing by convening stakeholders and getting them to talk to each other. I mean, of course, WIPO doesn't say, here's a new treaty we're all going to sign. Uh, and I just saw we got an extra 10 minutes. So now I'm going to talk much slower. Um, you know, WIPO has to work through consensus and consensus is very difficult to achieve and impossible to achieve when really all these jurisdictions haven't made their own minds up about what policies they want to pursue. And as with many areas of international harmonization with IP, different countries have different interests. So, you know, the UK is an IP exporter. It is, you know, according to its industrial strategy, at least trying to become a global AI superpower. Not every country is an IP exporter and an AI global superpower. And so protection of AI generated works, you know, as a policy matter may very much depend on what jurisdiction you're in. You know, to Daniel's point, I do take uh, what seems like prudent words and we ought to have some good empirical evidence before making policy. You know, I'm not sure that is kind of generally the standard that judges or policymakers have used historically in making IP related decisions or that that sort of data is out there and it is very challenging to come by. And, you know, waiting is a real problem if companies are making these investments in building platforms to do these things, like in drug discovery, you know, to have it go 10 years down the line and suddenly find out, well, we can't get patent protection for it at all. You know, to me, themes in what both Dan and Daniel said were kind of about, well, you know, an AI doesn't think, it isn't creative, even if it does something that resembles human creativity. And, and to me, that's not such a relevant thing. You know, if we're looking at making a new medicine, I don't really care whether a pharmacologist advisor semantically understood what they were doing when they were sitting at a lab bench mixing chemicals until they got something they wanted. You know, I just want new medicines. And if a self-driving car is on the road, I don't care if it, you know, can have an existential crisis. I just don't want it to run me over. And, and in part that, you know, this does take us back to, well, what really is the purpose of the IP system? And I think that varies by jurisdiction too. You know, in the US and UK, I think there's much more of an incentive mechanism where, you know, a lot of these really do depend on significant investments for commercialization, not just discovery. And, you know, when I'm in France and I talk about this, people seem horrified by the idea that an AI could be an author. And this is, you know, you know, we have copyright to protect authors, not to protect Warner Brothers and, you know, Penguin Books. But uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think this is clearly um, an issue that, that requires uh, much more time than we have. Um, Something that, that no one has really, um, I think, put squarely on the table is, is, is what Ryan, you alluded to. I think we have to draw a distinction between our theories that justify IP and the, what we are really, this panel has delineated as the central focus. Um, of innovation and that is human flourishing. And part of the challenge is that we certainly in the utilitarian mode, we've assumed that you know the, the greatest output for the greatest number is always the mode um, by which we, we should measure um, IP, which explains at least from the US perspective why we do grant these patents without any serious question or inquiry about um, the impact on human welfare. Um, um, you know, the, the, my good friend Margot Bagley would say the morality question. Um, and perhaps to Professor Gervais point, part of this is saying if we are going to redesign the system or expand the system, um, not only do we need data, but we need to think about the consequences of that. 
Um, there are, uh, there's one question that I thought was important to, to pose to, to all of you and to anyone who wants to answer this, but Vince asked, why do we have to have either or, um, both AI and humans in practice, um, innovate together, um, and innovation can occur um, without either. Right, um, you know, and and so why why do we have to choose? Um, uh, anyone want to respond to that, Daniel? Sure. Um, well, it's a good question, and and no one is suggesting I think either or. Um, but uh, so we have patent doctrines that are pretty clear when they're co-inventors. Uh, it's not because you brought coffee to the lab that you're a co-inventor. So. Uh, it's, and there are standards to be named as an inventor. Now, if you have humans and machines and you have a substantial human contribution, the fact that the machine assisted, I don't think is going to be a bar to, pat, to the patent uh, uh, you know, being issued. But what, what I think is happening, so uh, what, uh, what, what Ryan mentioned is, is, is you know, companies need, need to get these patents because they're investing. But I would think this is... Um, you know, it's, it's always the, the case that when you're at the edge of uh, any patent doctrine, um, you're taking a risk and you're taking a KSM risk or an Alice risk. And I'm referring to Supreme Court cases that basically invalidated a whole bunch of existing patents when they came out. I mean, the patents were not formally invalidated, but they were no longer enforceable under these, these the doctrines in those cases. That might happen here. Who knows? I think this. So it's it, the fact is that these determinations are being made by courts implies this risk um, that uh, that it ultimately these patents may well be issued, but 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 not come out. Uh, uh, you know, the same way when 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 litigated. Uh, and who knows? No one can can safely predict that. Um, so this would call for a legislative solution. But then I'm back to what uh, uh, a professor Khadija just mentioned, which is really what. Uh, why, why do we want these rights? Do we benefit? Uh, do, do we humans benefit from this? And I think this is the, the conversation that, um, that we need to have. And yes, AI will produce new things, uh, new stuff, and some of it will be valuable. But A, it's not because it's valuable that it's protectable. Uh, and uh, second is, what are the costs associated with having um, these machine-made inventions on, you know, on a more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, societal scale. And of course, I'm using shortcuts here. Uh, so I, I think uh, we're, we're going to have to work on this. I think it's the role of scholars to try to get as much of the data as possible to analyze a lot of the data. And as uh, Professor Burke was, was saying, I think the idea of um, things like bias and so on, we really need to be very, very careful uh, because once these things are, they're like self-driving cars. Once they start going in one direction, uh, they're harder to stop. Speaking of that, there are two questions that I will raise, um, one to Professor Burke and the other to um, Professor Burke and Professor Sun, and then one to Dr. Abbott. Um, so Professor Burke, uh, someone asked the question uh, whether it might make sense to create a new class of inventorship to avoid some of the concerns that you and Professor Sun um, have highlighted and also Professor Gervais. So um, this is um, Ching Kit Chow asked whether it's practicable to create a whole new class of inventorship for AI, essentially a sui generis um, uh, model with its own rights, protections, responsibilities on top of the existing system. So I'll uh, put that out there. And then um, uh, Dr. Abbott, someone asked um, early, uh, Eric Shattuck wanted to know, um, many inventive AI systems are used under licensing agreements and, and what would you suggest or how would you suggest the law address the more complex relationships when determining ownership and responsibility over outputs. So uh, a minute each, please, uh, Professor Burke, Professor Sun, and then Dr. Abbott. So uh, again, as, as I said before, as Professor Gervais talked about in, in his presentation, um, if somebody wants to expand this, the, the ambit of intellectual property law, uh, you need to come forward with some pretty uh, compelling data that we should do that. So if we're going to create new classes of inventorships, whether that's 
joint inventorships with machines or whether that's uh, AIs by themselves, you know, we, we really need some compelling reason to do that. I see absolutely no compelling reason to do that, right? Um, we know from the sociology of, 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 of technical work, um, humans use tools, right? You know, if I'm gonna build a machine, I'm gonna use a wrench, I'm gonna use a screwdriver, I'm gonna use a power drill. Uh, if I'm gonna do laboratory work, I'm gonna use a centrifuge, I'm gonna use uh, laboratory equipment. Um, uh, humans are always in this network of socio-technical uh, creativity, right? Um, we don't think that my centrifuge or my wrench or my screwdriver is a co-inventor. Um, you know, uh, and so the, the question we have to ask is, as you know, as we add new actors, new actors into this network of uh, humans and, and technology, um, again, fo we focus on the humans because that's what we care about. Has the human made enough of contribution? Has the human, uh, you know, been important enough in that network of, of activity um, to be named an inventor or not? Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, if we're going to create new classes of inventors, we need some reason to do that. But we've certainly never done it before, and I see absolutely no uh, evidence that we need to do it now. I'll try to answer five things in one minute. I think this is why artificial intelligence is exactly the right term for this phenomenon and why it's very different, at least in some circumstances, than a centrifuge. Because the AI is doing the thing that used to make a person an inventor. Right. You are now going to the AI and saying out of your library, pick the antibody that treats this disease. Here it is. Right. That is human like behavior, whether or not it knows what it's doing. The output is something that a person would generate and why we shouldn't have two systems of ownership, because whichever is more efficient at generating the thing that benefits all of us as a society, that new medicine you know, is something that we shouldn't tell a company, well, you can't use an AI to make a medicine because you need a patent. Go to people, even if they're slower and more expensive and worse at making that. Um, you know, and to Dan's point, on, well, to, to Daniel's point first on the cost of granting more protection, um, you know, that works in both directions. If, if we are not going to have AI being used in R&D in a way that optimally provides social benefit because we are under protecting its output, then that has costs too. And I do agree with him that there is an empirical answer to this question, but it's one that is very difficult to answer. And, you know, as we're redesigning patent law, you know, or IP law, we might think about that across the board. You know, finally, to give an example from Dan's point, you know, we have historical biases in the patent prosecution system. We have AI that, you know, if left to its own devices, gets built in with these historical biases. You know, being aware of that and having appropriate governance mechanisms and having multidisciplinary teams working on these things, you know, maybe an opportunity to have AI, you know, as part of decision making to correct bad decisions being made by human examiners, or at least pointing out that they are, you know, giving disparate weights to different sorts of applications. So, you know, AI may, ex you know, continue ex ex current biases. It may also be a tool for removing them if done properly. I, I can see that that we are waking up and heating up and and um, engaging, but our time for our panel is up. I'm going to leave three questions on the table that I think the next panel, uh, our copyright panel, um, uh, can uh, likely will 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 address. Um, someone asked the question um, that I think is is important about the constraints of the international IP system, um, particularly with duration, um, wondering, well, how do we, if, if we simply um, add AI as an inventor, then um, do we open up the, all the, the, the full panoply of rights and privileges and power um, on the global scene that um, inventors and owners currently have? Um, so, you know, that's a question. Uh, someone introduced also uh, an issue about equity. Um, one of the challenges, of course, with um, artificial intelligence um, is both massive data sets to train um, and also um, uh, computing power, which many inventors, um, at least non-corporate inventors, uh, will not have equal access to. And so back to Professor Burke's point, are we embedding existing or creating new inequities um, in, in the patent system? Um, and then the last, um, I think, um, 
uh, one of the things that uh, Stephen uh, Jamar and Salishi Herko have both asked um, is really whether or not um, we don't do, we aren't doing violence to our common law concepts of ownership um, and property um, and rights. Uh, by introducing um, artificial intelligence. In other words, the, the, the concern about distorting an already problematic legal regime, the patent system, by adding um, artificial intelligence and the unique considerations around it. We have barely defined public interest, much less um, understood what to do with utility and non-obviousness. And we're, we're still figuring our way out of Alice. And the question is, you know, are we trying to blow up the system or really um, think about what the system is meant to do? So on that note, um, let me say thank you uh, to all of our panelists, uh, Professor Gervais, uh, Professor uh, Burke, uh, Dr. Abbott, and Professor Sun for um, an important uh, conversation, one that will clearly be ongoing. There are lots of issues and questions on the table, and I am very glad to have launched off this webinar um, with um, this great panel. So help me thank our panelists, and I will hand over uh, to Professor Mark McKenna, uh, who will moderate the second panel that will focus on copyright.